During praise and worship, the Lord was speaking to me and I wrote some stuff down. And I want to tell you that the message today is going to be really, 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 really good. Um, it's going to open some things up. But the Lord began to speak to me on a personal level. And, you know, like I was saying before, if you haven't experienced, if you haven't experienced this yet, where you're reading the Word and the Word of God becomes, you know, it just, I mean, if you're looking through this light that's on this, I mean, I, I, what I see here, I see the light, but I also see a DNA chain, you know, it, it's Jesus Christ, you know, and when you begin to read the Word of God in that light, I mean, God just begins to illuminate you with things that will absolutely change your life. I want to throw a few things at you right now um, that I heard the Lord speak in doing praise and worship and how it amazing it ties in. Jason went from singing, you know, illuminate what's right in front of me. Man, if, if you don't read the, the Word of God and God doesn't illuminate things in front, you know, what's in front of you, ask Him. And I'm going to tell you something. This service today is very, very serious. Serious, serious service. They're always serious, but God is speaking big time. The next thing he sang was, I love your presence. Man, if you don't like being in the presence of the Lord, something's wrong. Let me tell you this. If you are not longing for his presence, for him to come and visit you and be with you, something's wrong. And then he sang, you know, um, that the next song was, I've been ushered into his presence. Man, you realize that I mean, God is calling you and me, you know, like I started this morning, not just, you know, outside the church. I mean, what good is it if you guys came today and stayed outside? Oh, yeah, you went to church? Yeah, I went to church today. Well, did you go in? Did you come in and hear from the Lord? What did He say? Oh, well, you know, I had some other things. I wound up getting a phone call, and I had to go outside, and I had to do this, and really? You know, you, you, if you're not in His presence, you're missing it. And God has some good, amazing things He wants to show you. Man, first thing the Lord spoke to me, and this wasn't had anything to do with the message today. Baptism. There is baptism, and there is the baptism of the Holy Ghost with fire. And you're going to find out what that is. The baptism... John's baptism was a baptism of just repentance from dead works. Hey, it was a repentance from dead works. What does that mean? That means that the works they were doing prior wasn't alive. Everything that we're producing was dead. And basically, he was saying, stop doing that. That's all John's baptism was about. Okay, you know, most people when they walk down the aisle today to be baptized, repent and be baptized for remission of sins, every one of you, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people just walk down the aisle and that's what they do. They want to be, I mean, it's all part of the born again experience. But the call that was there, that call had always been there to be born again. The call now was to be endued with power, to be baptized with the Holy Ghost or with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I'm not talking about speaking in tongues. I'm not talking about that. So most of the people today who, you know, you know, have you been baptized? Most of the people that walks up the aisle today goes up there, yeah, I've been baptized. I repented and I was baptized. And, you know... I'm not supposed to do those things I did anymore. Well, man, you need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that you can convince other people Amen. about Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're gonna we're gonna read that and see it. Check this out. Now I don't want I don't want it, you're gonna see what I'm talking about so it's not, you know, misunderstood. The Bible is clear. We all need to repent and ask Jesus in our heart and be baptized. Amen. I'm talking about a baptism that'll now make you a witness. Amen. That'll make you a witness. A witness of what? A witness of who Jesus Christ is. Amen. And we're going to see that. 
baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. This is the works of God in which brings life into people. And it brings good works, not dead works. John's baptism was unto, you know, his was the baptism of repentance. Didn't have anything to do. The call to the children of Israel was repent and be baptized, you know. Stop doing the dead works, meaning that the law is not going to save you. All of these things you're doing, it only brought death. The law would bring death, right? And then the Lord spoke to me, said, Our life now should be a life in which produces everlasting life. And the pursuit to know Him more. So you, so you can be more effective for His kingdom. Listen to what I'm saying. Our life now should be a life in which produces everlasting life in others. And it needs to be a pursuit to know Him, Jesus Christ, more than you ever knew Him before. Why? So that you, as an individual, can be more effective for Jesus Christ. Amen. You understand that? Amen. That means that you can explain Jesus and tell Jesus to others that, well, you know, well, I've already repented and been baptized. You know, well, what else? You know, the majority can't take you any further. But you can read and study your Bible. And when you read and study in the Bible, the Lord will show you, hey, this is me. This is me. And what's going to happen, that begins to illuminate in your life. And then what you want to do is you want to run and show others. Man, look at this. You know, Jesus is the Lamb. Jesus is everything He said He, is, he was. And that's what it's all about. The majority of the people who are baptized today are being baptized unto repentance and John's baptism, not unto the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and which makes you and me a witness for Him, causing people by the Word of God, that is Jesus Christ, causing people to understand Jesus Christ more. To let people understand and know, hey, He is the Son of God that takes away the sins of the world. Let me prove it to you. I remember I was giving a message, you know, um, Pastor Allen came to me and he said to me, he said this, he told me, he said, hey, I, I, you know, we're doing a seminar, we're going to have three different speakers, I want you to be one of the speakers. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is who He says He is. I was like, what? Yes, indeed, son. I'll take that. So what I did was I went from the Old Covenant and I wound up ministering on the scarlet thread. That was the message I ministered. If you hadn't seen it, I was young and a whole lot skinnier then, but son, it was fire. I proved and I showed the blood trail from, from the Garden of Eden all the way to when Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, that every time we seen the blood, it was Jesus Christ. Man, when I was in this message, it was so amazing. Because this is what I'm talking about. Jesus, the Holy Ghost, will make you a witness with power. Power. And that's what, when you have it, there it is right there. This is it. The scarlet thread. This is the first message I ever ministered. I was challenged. I was challenged. This, this, actually, this, this DVD went around the world. I heard. Yes. To Ethiopia. <laughs> Can you imagine? I got a phone call from Ethiopia, text over the over the, the computer. Could you come over here and minister? <laughs> what? <laughs> but I showed a blood trail from the beginning all the way to the end, showing that Jesus Christ was who he says he is. I mean, can you imagine going in the garden in the very beginning and when God killed a lamb? The Bible says that the Lamb of God was was, you know, sacrificed, was, you know, before the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God was slain. So that first sacrifice that was in the garden, that was a picture of Jesus Christ. 
and I could show how it was a picture of Jesus Christ. And then I remember when the Lord took me to Cain and Abel, when Cain slew Abel, and Cain's name means smith a metal spear, and Abel's name means breath or life, and Cain, his, he was a tiller like Adam was a tiller, and Abel was a shepherd like Jesus was a shepherd. You remember that? Abel was a shepherd, right? Well, Jesus was a shepherd, right? Well, Cain pierced his brother's side. Really? Would a, his name means smith or metal spear. That's why Cain was a picture of Adam who sinned, so Jesus Christ had to come, right? Adam was a pit, you know, and Abel was a, was, a, was a shepherd. Jesus is a shepherd. Abel's name means breath and life, and Jesus is our breath and our life. So these Cain and Abel, these twins that was in the beginning, just like God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, remember that? He made him to look like his very express image and likeness. The two Adams were twins. That's why Cain and Abel were twins. And Adam's sin killed Jesus. And Cain Cain's sin killed Abel. And you remember Cain was a tiller of the ground? Just like his daddy was a tiller of the ground. And Abel was a shepherd, just like Jesus was a shepherd. And remember that when they crucified... Remember the, the Bible says that when Cain killed Abel, the ground opened up to receive the blood. The only other time in the Bible that the ground opened up was with Jesus Christ when he was on the cross. The, the earth shook and the rocks rent. They opened up to receive the righteous blood of Jesus Christ. So there was a picture. And you think it's just by some coincidence that, you know, Cain pierced his brother's side with a metal spear, and when Jesus is hanging on the cross, he pierces, you know, he pierced Jesus' side, then blood, no. And I begin to go down. And you remember with David, remember King David and, and the tabernacle of David, I'd showed how David was a picture of Christ. And when the Ark of the Covenant, when David was transporting the Ark, remember it says that he went and got the, you know, he went and got an ox cart with some ox and put the ark, you know, on the cart and brought it to Obed-Edom's house, which means Obed means red and Edom means servant, a red servant. You know, Adam means red servant. Adam means the red ground. Jesus was the red man that hung on the cross. Well, David, who was a picture of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that one would be raised up in the last days that would sit on the seat of David. David was a king. David was red and ruddy. Right? Remember? It's a picture of Jesus Christ. He was a red man on the cross. Here it is. David's carrying in the ark, puts it on a cart, but he's not supposed to be handling the ark like that. And Uzzah puts forth his hand, and God smotes him. So they take the ark of the covenant, and they bring it into the red servant's house, Obed-Edom, and it stays there for three months. And David's afraid of the ark because God smote Ob uh, Uzzah, who touched it, actually just trying to help it. The, the ox cart stumbled, and Uzzah put forth his hand to stop it. Man, why did God? Because it represents the law of God. It represented the law. No matter, look, God said, don't touch it. And if you touch it, and one of the things is, when the ox, when the, when the Ark of the Covenant was coming back into Jerusalem, there was, the only thing that was in it was the law. There was no golden pot that had manna in the rod that was taken out. Therefore, judgment hit him. As soon as Uzzah put forth his hand, bam, God killed him. David's freaking out. Oh my God, I can't handle this thing. Bring it to Obed-Edom's house, which was a Gentile. <laughs> That's symbolic of the ark staying with you and me. And guess what? When they come and took the ark, he was weeping, son. He was like, what? And God blessed Obed-Edom in his house for three months. He prospered. And he said, wherever the ark's going, I'm going. And that Gentile followed him. Is that not crazy? So when the ark's leaving, David, King David, he's like, I know how I need to transport the ark because it says in the law I need to get the priest. So David, who was a picture of Jesus Christ, goes to Shiloh. He gets the priest, the Levitical priesthood. It's got to be carried on their shoulders, remember? So now David's in the front. This this is crazy. David's in the front. This is in 1 Samuel. He gets naked. 2 Samuel, I'm sorry. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And this is so crazy, showing the power of God. It says to David, man, this is, I mean, this is so absolutely mind-blowing that David, you know, he, uh, when he's going to carry the ark all the way up to, the t to, to Jerusalem, 
He said, carry this ark to Jerusalem. Now he's got the priests right here behind him. They got the ark of the covenant. It says this, and David, he walked six paces. One, two, three, four, five, six. David, he's naked before the Lord. He's just girded with a linen cloth. And he stops and makes a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. And he walks six paces more and he stops and he sacrifices. And he works six paces more and he stops and he sacrifices. And he, why is God saying he's walking six paces and he stops and sacrifices? David was a picture of Jesus Christ. Six is the number of man. God created man on the sixth day. What God was saying, it's going to be a man that I sacrifice. It's going to be a man that I sacrifice. It's going to be a man. And that man was the Ark of the Covenant. That's why it's lined up. So they had a blood trail from Obed-Edom's house all the way to the Temple of Jerusalem. This is 1,000 years before Jesus Christ comes. That blood trail that was laid out for him, 1,000 years before he comes, Jesus Christ comes bearing the cross on his back, walking on that same blood-stained trail, pouring his blood out on it, and God saying, This is the man! This is the man! This is the man! That's power, son. Yeah, I'll prove to you who Jesus Christ is through His Word. Amen. You think that's just by any chance or any coincidence? I don't think so. No. That's the power that you want to be endued with to prove that takes people like they go like, Wow! I want that! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And who can do that? Only by the power of the Holy Spirit who illuminates the Word of God and shows you. Who does He show you? Jesus Christ. He was the ark. He was David. It was the man. God revealed that to me through His Holy Spirit. And that's why that's so powerful, son. And it's good every time you hear it. Yeah. In fact, it gets better. Tied to the Lord. Amen. Tie it to beloved. Tell me. What you talking about? When Jesus is being baptized, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Come on. The word beloved there means David, David. This is my David. That's right. My king. Check that out. You heard what she said, Charlene said? When Jesus was being baptized in the Jordan, in the Strong's Concordance, that word means, this is my beloved. Remember that? Man, we can get crazy now. We can get really crazy because we could tie some stuff in. We could tie some big stuff in. Beloved means David, right? It means David. This was Jesus. When God said, this is my beloved son, that word is David. This is my David. Yes. And whom I am well pleased. Acts 15, 16, Amos 9, 11. The Bible says, I took you from the old covenant to the new covenant. Amos 9, 11. For God shall raise up again the tabernacle of David that is fallen. Acts 15, 16, it says that Jesus Christ was that tabernacle, yes. son. Yes. Hallelujah. Ah! <laughs> and you can't take that from me. Right. Because neither was I taught by man, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. That's the power He reveals. That's what transforms your life. That's why when we go and minister at places, the people are like, Wow! What is that? That's power, Sean. <laughs> when Jesus spoke of authority and power, what was He doing? He was proclaiming who He was through the whole covenant full of grace and mercy and full of the power of the Holy Spirit. The Pharisees and Sadducees said, hey, we dare not ask him any more questions. <laughs> they didn't want to fool with him no more. Jesus Christ is real. Amen. And he's alive. Yes, he is. And it's his word. And that's not even the message. I was challenged to prove. And that ain't even the, that ain't even the beginning of it. When I was challenged to do that, man, you, what? I'll prove to you beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ who he, is who He says He is. Man. Amen. Oh, thank you, Father. That was just a warm-up.
Yeah. You ain't started yet. <laughs> the juices are flowing now. <laughs> I can feel the spirit. He's well, I, I, man. That means the spirit's coming. Man, it ain't holy spirit either. <laughs> Listen to this. Do you know that <laughs> my brother's gonna get the umbrella because I'm spitting? <laughs> One time I was ministering the whole front row to, 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 in a church. The two front rows, all the ladies talk. Cherie and my wife and Ollie and all the other ladies that were there. They all brought raincoats. Rebecca, they brought raincoats. <laughs> the church. Why? Because we know you're gonna start spitting and sweating, and we need to cover up. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to this. Do you know that the children of Israel died after eating the bread from heaven? Do you know how many people sit in church every single day and eat the bread from heaven? Right? Because they never drew near. They never drew near to Jesus. They go to church, they hear a little message. Some go to church and hear the same message over and over and over. And they're tired of hearing the message. I mean, come on. Do we got to eat, you know? Are we eating tacos again today for the, you know, the 70th time in a row? Can I, can I have like a hamburger, maybe something a little different? <laughs> right? That's what people feel like in church. Man, hey, man, the Bible says the depths of the Lord is unsearchable. Amen. How deep and you can, unsearchable how deep He is. That He's always bringing up something new. If you're with Him. Right. Do you know that the children of Israel died after eating the bread from heaven because they never drew near even after tasting and seeing that the Lord was good? Do you know how many people hear these messages? Hear these messages about the power and showing forth the power of the Holy Ghost and they go on, they, they go on to destruction because they never, they never pursue it. Oh, it's good, it's good, it's good, and they leave. And they come back the next week, oh, it's good, it's good, it's good. That is not what the Word of God was meant for. Right. Not to tickle you and make you feel good. Yeah, it makes you feel good, but it was, it's to teach you right. so you can learn more of Him so that you can go be a witness for Him. Right. That's, right. That's what the church is about. Is there really anything, and I want you to ask yourself this, really deeply, because this is what, this ties into the very last song my brother sang. Is there really anything that is more important than Him? Well, then pursue Him then. Amen. If there's nothing more important than Him, well, then pursue Him. Go after Him. Don't say there's nothing more important than Him and then, you know, He's last on your list. Amen. Come on, brother. Because the Bible says that those who seek Him diligently, continually, that will happen. We'll find Him. Is work more important? Is there really anything that is more important than Him? Because this life is here today and gone tomorrow. Our life is a vapor in the wind dust in the wind it's gone so what matters does it matter you know how many buildings we built or how many you know businesses we opened or how good you know our place looks or how you know much stuff we have does any of that matter that matters absolutely zilch nothing it won't even be brought up in heaven it won't even be talked about Come on. What's going to matter to him is, were you my witness? Amen. Did you build my kingdom? Or did you bring, build yours? Come on, brother. Or someone else's kingdom? Is work more important? Is family more important? Is something, is it something you have to do that's more important than him? Oh, I gotta do this. Oh, I gotta do that. Oh, I can't be here because I gotta go here. 
What's more important is you receiving the Word of God here is more important than anything else in your life. Amen. There's nothing more important because when you miss here, you're missing out on something great. Amen. Show in life what's more important than you, for you. Look, it took a lot for me to shut down Fridays so I could, you know, all my Fridays is gone. It's me with the Lord. You know, here, Lord, this is what I need to do. I need to be with you. That's showing him something. The only thing we really have to do is pursue him. That's the most important. Now, we got to work and we got to do other things. But first in your life and in my life should be Jesus Christ. And if he is, believe me, others will know. Because you'll talk about him. And you'll share. We have to pursue him first. Just like Jesus said. Jesus said that? He did. Jesus said this. Not Pastor Joseph. Seek ye first. Amen. His kingdom. Come on. Right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then, all these other things. He don't even want to talk about the other things. Will be added unto you. Our life has to be a life that seeks Him. You remember... Jesus, remember Jason, this is what I, I was sitting down there, I wrote that, I wrote this right here. And I said, it's over, and I was about to come up and get up and come play. And Jay said, there's one more thing I want to do. He wants to sing to Jesus. Man, can you imagine how many of you guys want to sing to him? It's not about coming to church and how beautiful you sing. And how beautiful that, you know, others, oh, well, I think we need to do this. I, need, I think we need to do that. No. You know what? When he's everything, you want to sing him a love song. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. And then he goes on, kings and kingdoms. The very last thing I wrote about the kingdom is now the Spirit is moving on him. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about His name. Amen. That was, I want to sing a love song to you. Man, as I sing to Him, I'm walking in a yard and I tell Him, Lord, I love you. I love you so much. Because I do. He showed me things. Man, all he wants you to do is don't stop at the door. He wants you to come in so he can reveal things to you that will show you things that will blow you away. Let's get into the message. The message today, if you don't know, knowing how God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that, oh, I want to tell you something. The Lord just reminded me of this. I just, He told me to go back to it. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these other things will be added. When God left, when Jesus left this earth, he told 500 to go wait and tarry. Right? I guess the other 380 had something more important to go do. They had to leave. Oh, oh yeah, I'm part. I'm with you. And I'm part and I'm all there. But look, I got to go run. I got something I got to go do. But look, I'll be back. Well, that's funny. 380 didn't come back. And there was 120 that was in the upper room that received the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, yes, it's for all of us today. 
on your handmaidens and he would pour that out upon everybody. And I'm sure some of them, you know, but the initial, man, can you imagine saying, hey, I was in the upper room on the day of Pentecost when the, the sound of the Russian mighty wind came. I saw the cloven like divided tongues of fire that sat on the head. The other, three, the other 380 can't say that. I was there, son. <laughs> there ain't nothing like having a direct witness that was right there and saw the whole thing. Wow! I saw when God parted the Red Sea. I saw Pharaoh's armies die. I picked up their armor on the other side. Don't tell me my God ain't real. I think they would rather hear from that guy rather than me. Man, can you imagine hearing that? A guy who was with Moses in the Red Sea party is going to be at the church speaking tonight. And Joseph is going to be over there talking about it as well. Guess what? Ain't nobody going to be by Joseph. Guess what? Joseph ain't even going to be by Joseph. Joseph's going to be over there. If you go over there looking for him, you're going to be over here. <laughs> Yes! Anyway, don't miss it. Cause, because, just because you've ate and tasted of the heavenly bread doesn't mean you're going to cross over. Amen. A million and a half people left Egypt. A million and a half. Everyone from 20 years older and up, 20 years old and up that left, died in the wilderness except Joshua and Caleb. Wow. In fact, the army that they surrounded, that you know, the tabernacle with was 600,000 foot soldiers. Only two out of that 600,000 crossed over into the promised land. And they all ate the manna. Wow. Because only faith can cross you over. Amen. Only faith can bring you to the end. Amen. That's why it says, now these three. Faith, hope, and love is what's going to get you to the other side. If you lose faith, if you lose hope, and you don't love, you're finished. Wow. Let's read. I want to bring you today, where we at right now, is actually, if we go back in history, right now today, the children of Israel, I mean, um, if we go back in history right now today, all the disciples would be gathered in the upper room right now. Right now, today. Mm -hmm. Waiting to be a dude of power. Right. That's where they would be. Because June the 12th is Pentecost. And today is June the 4th? Yeah. Today's June the 4th. Four. So, now, check this out. If we go back in time, Jesus, two days ago, which would have been June the 2nd, would have went up on a cloud in front of their face. And right there, he would have told them that go wait, not many days hence, not many days from here, go wait till you be endued with power. Ten days later, they were filled. That's right. Right? So this is two days into the ten-day wait. So now the children of Israel that saw Christ arise and go up into heaven, he told the 500 to go wait until they be endued with power from on high, not many days from here. They would have known it was Pentecost. They would have known. It ain't like go and wait and just guess. No. No, they know what Pentecost is. And I'm going to show you how they knew. They knew when the power was coming. Because it comes at that time every time. So here it is. They go, you know, I don't even, I know 120 went. I know they all went there. Oh, well, I ain't staying here. I'm going to go wait at the house. And then I'm going to come back. Well, you got to know, realize that in Jerusalem at this time, there's probably two million people. 
So when you go get your spot where you're at in Israel, you know, with two million people there, because that's what it was, about two million. It was a feast that God called them all to. They had to appear in Jerusalem for Passover, Pentecost, and, and Yom Kippur. Three times a year they had to appear before the Lord. Right? Yeah. That was mandatory. Okay. So, there's about two million people there in Jesus' day. About two million. In fact, they come from the nations all over the place to come in. There's not even a, a hotel or an inn they could stay in. They're all camped out all around. So, you know, they're moving in there doing all of this, trying to get their spot. So when God said, go wait and tarry till you're being due with power, if they didn't go right there to their spot and wait, you know what the problem was? They wasn't getting back. Man, there's no way you're going to go fight through all that city and try to get through the... All them people ain't going to let us get through the streets. But I tell you what, 120 stayed. Right. And they, I got the power. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> now I'm getting back. <laughs> they're, getting, they're getting, you know, getting kind of heavy, you know. That's going, that's showing my age. <laughs> well, I got the new power now. You know, not that old junk. Thank you, Jesus. So, Pentecost. What is it? Let's talk about it. Pentecost is the culmination. It's the ending. It's the final day of the counting of the Omer. So remember, Jesus rode in on the tenth day. Right? Rode in on the tenth day. He appears in the house of God in the temple for four days. Right? Then they take him and they kill him on the 14th outside the gate. That's right. They hang him on a cross. Three days later, it's the 17th day now, he arose from the dead. Then he shows himself for 40 days to his disciples. And then on the 40th day, he says, go wait and tarry till Pentecost. He said it. Go wait and tarry till you be endued with power on Pentecost. So, what is it? Pentecost is the culmination of the counting of the Omer. What is the counting of the Omer? The Omer was 49 days from the resurrection to Pentecost. There was 49 days. Seven weeks of seven. That's 49. This also correlates with Daniel's 70th week. Right. 70 times 7 is 490 years. I'll connect that for you later. This is the same time. Because something's going to happen after the 70th week. It happened with Daniel. It's going to happen again when the Lord returns. Wow. That's a clue. So Pentecost is the culmination of the counting of the Omer. The counting of the Omer was seven weeks, 49 days, with a gathering in the barley. It's a harvest time. And Pentecost was the first day of the wheat harvest. Wow, the Lord likens us unto wheat. Put the wheat on one side and the tares on the other. Gather the tares and burn them. But the wheat, he says, put in my barn. How many people live in a barn in here? I do. <laughs> Got two people that live in a barn? <laughs> I live in a barn. I mean, Christ is born. Amen. So, Pentecost is the culmination of the counting of the Omer. The counting of the Omer begins on the Feast of First Fruits. That's when Jesus come out of the ground on the 17th day of Nisan. It lasts for seven weeks of seven or 49 straight days, right? And then Pentecost happens. That's the day the Holy Spirit came down. Pentecost in Hebrew is the word Shavuot. Okay? A Shavuot. It is called the Azret, which means the conclusion of the feast. It's the end of it. It's the conclusion. It's the conclusion to the Passover week. So from the beginning of Passover all the way to Pentecost, that day is the conclusion of it all. It's the wrapping up. It's the finishing. It's all over now. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. 
we see in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 through 11 we see this day and I'm going to read it to you Acts chapter 2 it says this and when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind that's the sound every the majority of the places in the Bible where you see wind it's the word Ruach HaKadosh the Holy Spirit Amen. the sound of the Russian mighty wind was the evidence that the Holy Spirit had come how do we know that because the Bible said in a strong east wind blew all night in part of the Red Sea that word wind is the Holy Spirit he comes in the wind That's right. right? The other place we see it is in the valley of dry bones. Oh, Daniel, prophesy, I mean Ezekiel, prophesy unto these dry bones that they may live. And the sound of a Russian mighty wind came through the valley. Amen. Ah! The wind. He shows up in the wind. And as many other places in the Bible, that's why it says they knew when the sound, it says, and, and suddenly, verse 2, there came a sound of a, from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothing like tongues of fire. That's divided tongues. Right? And it sat upon each of them. The Lord will speak to you out of the wind. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there, this is why they began to speak with other tongues, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem devout men of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad that the multitude had come together, when, when this was noised abroad, people all over Jerusalem started hearing, and they were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. Right? And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our tongue where we were born? We're hearing them speak in our own language. And then it goes on and tells you all that was the Parthians, the Medes, and all of this. Castle Bidea, they were all there. The Cretes, verse 11. It says, and the Arabians, we do hear them speak our tongues, the wonderful works of God. They're hearing in their own language the wonderful works of God, meaning what God has done, right? That's why that day they spoke in tongues, because of all the tongues that were there, the divided nations. They were hearing the Holy Spirit's going to empower you to do something, to be a witness, remember? Watch this. And they were all amazed and were in, and were in doubt. They were confused, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mock, saying, These men are filled with new wine. They need an interpreter. What is going on? We're hearing the wonderful works of God being spoke to us in our own language, right? Check this out. Verse 14. Peter explains Pentecost. How does he explain Pentecost? Watch what he's got to do. How does he explain it? Well, to be endued with power from on high is to have an understanding of the Old Covenant. To sit in the seat of Moses, to be able to interpret the law with authority, to know what it means. So what does Peter do? Being filled now with the Spirit, having an understanding of what the Old Covenant means, he says this. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah and all that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. This man has some understanding now. You understand? For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour. That's nine o'clock in the morning. 
But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Wow. Wow. He's going to now explain Joel to you and me. How? Because he's got the power of the Holy Spirit on him now. And that's what the power of the Holy Spirit has come to do to make you and me a witness that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. Wow. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass. He's quoting Joel. Let me stop right here. I'm going to come back to that. I want to tie some more stuff into you. I'm going to come back to it. Because it's going to tie it all in. Let's go. Let's look at this real quick. If we take a close look at the feast... If we take a close look at this feast, spiritually speaking, so if we're going to look at what this feast I just talked about from Passover to Pentecost, spiritually speaking, what does it mean? What does it mean to you and me? We will see that it represents a believer's life in Jesus. Right? It is a representation of our journey out of Egypt which is a type of the world system. Remember, because, and what I'm telling you here is, remember, everything that's happening in Jesus' day right now with the Passover and all that started in Egypt. So Israel's in bondage in Egypt, and they got to kill the Passover lamb and put it on a door, right? So they leave the altar, which Egypt is the altar, the place where the firstborn died, right? They go to the Red Sea. They come up out of the Red Sea on the other side, which was the 17th day. The same Jesus came up out of the ground. Is that not crazy? That's amazing, huh? Right? Then they go on a 40, they go on uh, the, the, the counting of the Omer. They go 49 days, and now they appear at Mount Sinai on Pentecost. So now Mount Sinai is the exact same day as Pentecost in the New Testament. So these two are in the same, the same day. So check this out. So it is a representation of just like the children of Israel came out of Egypt, which to us, it's like us coming out of the world system. Now we're in the wilderness of life, awaiting our time to meet God face to face. At or on Mount Sinai. Well, what does that mean? That means just like the children of Israel, God told Moses, you go set the children of Israel free and bring them to me because I want to speak to them face to face. And when he gets to the mountain, they tell Moses, no, you go see what he said. <laughs> and, and they backed away. And you tell us what he said. That's what people do in life. God. Yeah. You're in life right now. And God, once you receive Jesus Christ, you're in your journey of life but between where you're at right now and being called to where God is. To come in and meet him face to face. Some people meet him face to face right now. When you get in his word, you're reading the word of God. That's like you come in faith. This is Jesus Christ. This is the word. He was the word made flesh. So when you're reading the word, you're actually coming face to face with him. He's the face bread. So what does it mean? So it's a representation of our journey out of Egypt. The world system. In the wilderness of life, waiting our time to meet God face to face at or on Mount Sinai, which is a representation. Mount Sinai is just the Holy of Holies. It's like coming through the tabernacles from the altar to the laver. Remember, Egypt was the altar, the place of blood. Then the laver was the Red Sea. And then they enter into the holy place, right? All the way to the mountain, which is the Holy of Holies where God calls them in. But in those days, they couldn't even put foot on a mountain because, you know, the way unto the Holy of Holies hadn't been made yet because it was made through Jesus Christ. Now we can come boldly to the throne. You understand? That's why I said so much as anyone that touch a foot on a mountain, put their foot on a mountain, they'll be shot through. They had to stand on the outside and wait. All right, Lord, speak. He just came down and started speaking. They ran away. And Jesus said, you don't have to run away no more. Don't worry about it, man. Just come. Mount Sinai represents the Word of God. It represents the Torah. 
Mount Sinai. God didn't give them law. You go look it up. It says he gave them Torah. We say, oh, we, God gave them the law. Well, it was the law, but the word law right there is Torah. What is Torah? God gave them Torah, and Torah means direction, instruction, and guidance, and righteousness. God gave them His direction, and instruction, and His guidance. That's what He gave them. That's, you know, His law. His law is in there. But what He gave them was direction, instruction, and guidance. They received that at Mount Sinai. They became witnesses on Pentecost. The same thing. He gave them, go wait and tarry till you be endued with power. He gave them direction, instruction, and guidance until you receive power so you can go be a witness for me. <laughs> same thing. Watch this. There at Mount Sinai, God revealed himself to us in a new and greater way. They got to see God in a new and greater way like they've never seen Him before. The Torah given at Mount Sinai represents the Word of God. It represents, check this out, the entire Bible. How can it represent the entire Bible? Because it testified of Jesus Christ to come and He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yeah. Wow. Everything that they needed was right there. The children of Israel, or Jacob, reached Mount Sinai and came to the mountain. It was on Pentecost when God came down and revealed himself to his children. Wow. On Pentecost. The same day the Holy Spirit came down. The Torah was never intended to mean a code of do's and don'ts. Listen to this but rather it should be seen as God's instructions and teachings to us Amen. so that we can know Him better. Amen. Wow. The call is to come to Him so we can understand Him more. A believer in Yeshua, in Jesus, spiritually experiences Pentecost when the Holy Spirit reveals the Word of God to him or to her in a deeper and more powerful way. You heard that? A believer in Jesus, Yeshua, spiritually speaking, experiences, experiences Pentecost when the Holy Spirit reveals the Word of God, that light and that illumination, to him or to her in a deeper and more powerful way and his understanding and desire for the Bible increases more and more every day. If that's not happening to you, you haven't met him. If you want more of him, you've met him. Have you experienced this yet? Here, we see that the children of Israel, when they reach the mountain, they pull away, just like the 380 did, left. They pull away from God and they tell Moses, you tell us what God said. Or should I say, You interpret for us what it was that God was saying. I'm going to reveal something to you that's so absolutely mind-blowing. I got this this week studying. Do you know what happened on the day of Pentecost? They all came, the Holy Spirit came down and they began to speak in tongues and other languages. As the Spirit gave them utterance, they needed, on the day of Pentecost, when the wonderful works of God was being proclaimed, they needed an interpreter. Peter stands up and becomes that interpreter. Why? Why? Because he's filled 
Check this out. This is crazy. This is so, Jesus, my God is so amazing. <laughs> Did you ever wonder why Moses had a tongue problem? <laughs> Bobble <laughs> gobble, he couldn't even the bobble bobble. He started the bobble 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 to Moses. He got bobble 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 bobble. He said, "Lord, send somebody else." Moses is babbling on the day of Pentecost when other tongues, when the tongues are coming down. Oh, bo, 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 bo. I'm so a speech in tongue. Bo, 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 bo. Moses, the law, needed an interpreter. There's Aaron right there. Aaron is a picture of the high priest, which is Jesus Christ, the interpreter of the law. Shababble gobble. You understand what I'm saying? I do. Ah! Ah! <laughs> I can't do it. You need an interpreter to interpret the law. You can't hear it from Moses. Ah, there's, bro there's Aaron, your brother. His name means bright and splendor. That's Jesus Christ, the high priest who came, who interpreted the law of Moses. Ah. Do you understand the words that's coming out of my mouth? Anybody? I need yeah. You understand? <laughs> yes. You know what it is? What is it? Tell me. It's this right here. Then Peter said unto him, Repent, be ye baptized, every one of you. For That's me. exactly what I said. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Wow! God is amazing! The law needed an interpreter, man. And only the high priest could do that. Jesus Christ, our faithful high priest. It took him to interpret the law of Moses, to interpret the direction, instruction, and guidance. And he says, doesn't Moses testify of me? Mm. Shababble gowl. <laughs> that means, what am I saying? I'm saying you can open your Bible. Open your Bible. And you can go in the Old Testament and say, you see King David? And you, or you see Noah's Ark? Or you see the tabernacle of Moses? I'm going to interpret that for you. Though it sounds like gibberish to you and you don't understand it, I have the power of the Holy Spirit living in me. And it's all about Jesus. You begin to interpret. How many people, how many people have said, I don't understand all of that. And you said, hey, let me sit down and, and tell you what it means. You have become the interpreter. <laughs> what did the Ethiopian eunuch do when he was reading Isaiah? Do you know, Philip, hovering close, do you know what you're reading? He says, how am I to understand unless I have an interpreter? That's right, right. And he drew nigh unto the carriage and starting from Isaiah explained all about Jesus Christ. Right. What are you saying? I want what you got. There's water. Right. <laughs> you see, he didn't want the baptism of repentance. He wanted the baptism of the Holy Ghost so that he can interpret the scriptures more powerfully. Yeah. So that you can be endued with power to become witnesses. See, Jesus said the old covenant, I don't testify of myself, but the old covenant testifies me. That's what it truly means to be endued with power. The Shababble Gobble stuff you can keep. You can keep the Shababble Gobble. I sat in the church. Say it. You got it. You got something, but I don't know what it is. But it definitely is not the power or the Holy Ghost. Because I need somebody to interpret. <laughs> I'm going to end right there.
I love Jesus Christ and He loves you. I'm trying to get you, I'm trying to get you to go see Him. Start reading, getting your words. And start, if, you, if, you're not, if you used to seek Him and you're not seeking Him like you used to, hey, now's the time. Now's the time to start seeking after Him again. Because the Bible says if you draw near unto Him, He will draw near unto you and He'll show you things that will blow you away. And you'll be wanting to tell your friends, look at this. Amen. Check this out. You know what? Jesus loves you. It don't matter where you've been. It don't matter what you've done. It, you know what? Today is the day of forgiveness. Today is a day of forgiveness. So if you want to be forgiven, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord. Forgive us, Father, of our sins, Lord. Cleanse us, Father. And Lord, what's so amazing about you is, Father, you say that you take our sins and cast them in the, in the deepest part of the sea, in the sea of forgetfulness where no man can drag them up. That's what's so superior about grace. Where the law has a rehearsal of what we did, grace remembers no more. And I thank you, Father. And if you want to be forgiven, just say, Father, Father forgive, me, Lord. forgive me, Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. Cleanse me, Lord. Thank you. And Father, baptize me with your Holy Spirit so that I can be a witness for you. Amen. Shababble gobble. Shababble gobble. Thank you. God is so good, man. God is so good. People, be blessed. He loves you. Seek Him. Oh.